on World News Tonight. Boris quits. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has announced his resignation as Conservative Party leader following a wave of government resignations. Hunger rising. UN reports of a surge in hunger and poverty worldwide and expects it to get worse. Continuing investigation. After weeks of mounting pressure, the key witness of the January 6th capture riot now agrees to testify. And the run returns. Spain's bull running fest is back with a bang after Covid ban. This is Other There in a World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. And tonight's broadcast, we begin with breaking news from the United Kingdom. Boris Johnson has resigned today as Prime Minister as he finally bows the pressure of the swords of the government resignations, making a statement. A number 10 source said Mr. Johnson had spoken to a chairman of the Conservative backbench 1922 Quimti, Sir Graham Reddy, and agreed to stand down with a new Tory leader set to be in place by the party's conference in October. But several MPs are calling for a caretaker Prime Minister to be brought in to stop Mr. Johnson leading through the summer. The United Nations announced that hunger had surged around the globe in 2021 despite the COVID-19 virus stabilizing with the introduction of vaccines. Rising food and fuel costs combined with climate change are impacting hundreds of millions of people. Tonight, a new international report released with a dire global outlook detailing a rise of millions around the world, hungry and malnourished. A harrowing increase from just a few years ago. Now, one in 10 humans are suffering from hunger. We had hoped that with COVID stabilizing, um, we would see a reduction of that, of that impact. Uh, but we actually saw towards later in 2021 that food prices uh, increased. This report, conducted by multiple international food security programs, including UNICEF and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, saying between 702 million to 828 million people were affected by hunger in 2021. That's an increase of more than 150 million people from two years ago. Well, the numbers are depressing, but they're not unexpected. This sort of bigger jump, uh, particularly from 2019 to 2022, um, goes hand in hand with what you expect in the COVID pandemic as, as people's economic situations have unfortunately gone downhill. The numbers are even more striking when including those who are severely or moderately food insecure, rising to 2.3 billion people last year, according to the organizations. That's nearly 30 percent of the world population. I think um, we're likely to see these inequalities worsen and worsen, uh, particularly for the world's poorest. There was hope for a recovery after 2020's debilitating pandemic consequences, but world hunger further expanded. Russia's war in Ukraine also cutting off a major market for the world's wheat supply, causing surges in pricing, the global volatility fueling protests around the world over persistent high food prices. In some countries, internal debates over how much food they are exporting despite demands at home, leaving other import-reliant countries even more strapped. The report suggesting that today's current drivers could intensify the world's hunger problem in the future. Quote, conflict, climate extremes, and economic shocks combined with growing inequalities. The issue at stake is not whether adversities will continue to occur or not, but how we must take bolder action to build resilience against future shocks. Now, for the third time this year, Sydney has been hit by major floods. Scientists blame intense rainfall on combination with factors, but on social media, unfounded allegations of weather manipulation have spread widely. Heavy rain that pummeled Sydney over the last five days is today as floodway residents look to return to properties still inundated by floodwaters to take stock of the damage. About as much as eight months' worth of rain has come down in just four days, bringing parts of Australia's largest city to a standstill. Experts say no single factor can explain this extreme weather, pointing instead to warmer oceans and saturated soils as contributing factors. But conspiracy theorists aren't buying it. They blame that the extreme rainfall on cloud seeding and weather manipulation. There is no evidence to back up such theories, but this hasn't prevented flash floods from reaching thousands of people online. 
Over in the United States, the White House informed Kentucky Democrat Governor Andy Bashir's office in late June, the day before the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, that President Joe Biden intended to nominate an anti-abortion Republican as a federal judge in Kentucky. Newly released emails from the Kentucky governor's office show that President Joe Biden planned to nominate a Republican opposed to abortion rights to a lifetime appointment as a federal judge in the state. Just a day before the U.S. Supreme Court overturned its landmark 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling. The emails released on Wednesday show correspondence from a White House official advising that Biden intended to nominate Chad Meredith on June 24th to serve as a district court judge. Biden, a Democrat, has been sharply criticized by abortion rights organizations and progressives in his own party since reports emerged last week that the White House was considering Meredith, a former solicitor general and conservative who has defended abortion restrictions in Kentucky. The White House has declined to confirm the planned nomination ever since the Louisville Courier-Journal first reported the news. A spokesperson on Wednesday said it does not comment on judicial vacancies until nominees are named. An email sent on June 23rd, the day before the Supreme Court reversed Roe v. Wade, shows Kathleen Marshall, a White House senior advisor in the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, saying Meredith would be nominated the next day. In a June 29th email sent hours before the Courier-Journal's first report on the nomination, Marshall wrote that her original message was, quote, pre-decisional and privileged information. Meredith, now counsel at the law firm Squire Patton Boggs, did not respond to requests for comment. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir and Representative John Yarmuth, both Democrats, opposed the nomination, which Yarmuth said is likely a part of some larger deal on judicial nominations between Biden and Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, who would be required to approve district court nominees from his home state. Robert Sturrer, a spokesperson for McConnell, said his office won't have a comment until if slash when the president makes his nomination. Still in the U.S., the U.S. House Committee investigating the Jan 6 insurrection issued a subpoena to former White House counsel Pat Cipollone, who is said to have stringently warned against former President Donald Trump's effort to try to overturn his election loss. And now he has agreed to testify behind closed doors. Never been in a situation. Pat Cipollone, White House counsel to former President Donald Trump, has agreed to testify on Friday in a transcribed interview before the Congressional Committee investigating the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol, according to media reports. Cipollone's actions during the deadly attack were described by witnesses at previous hearings before the House Select Committee. Pat Cipollone said, yeah, this is a murder-suicide pact. Cassidy Hutchinson was a top aide to White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows at the time of the attack. And I remember Pat saying to him something to the effect of, the rioters have gotten to the Capitol, Mark. We need to go down and see the president now. And Mark looked up at him and said, he doesn't want to do anything, Pat. And Pat said something to the effect of, and very clearly, <laughs> Mark, something needs to be done or people are going to die and the blood's going to be on your effing hands. The committee subpoenaed Cipollone last week after Hutchinson's testimony. According to a New York Times report confirmed by CNN, Cipollone is appearing under subpoena and his testimony will not be in public. The committee did not immediately respond for comment. The subpoena followed dramatic public testimony from Hutchinson, who said Cipollone had warned her at the time that they could face every crime imaginable. If Trump went to the Capitol on January 6th, after delivering a fiery rally speech to his supporters. We will never give up, we will never concede. Armed with weapons, including AR-15 style rifles, Trump supporters marched to Capitol Hill in a failed effort to prevent lawmakers from certifying Democrat Joe Biden's victory over Trump in the November 2020 presidential election. The committee said in a statement last week that their investigation has revealed evidence that Cipollone repeatedly raised legal and other concerns about President Trump's activities on January 6th. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, in a setback for the fight against climate change, members of the European Parliament have voted in favour of plans to label investments in gas and nuclear power plants as green. This means that some nuclear and gas projects would be added to the EU taxonomy of economics activities that are considered environmentally sustainable. 
The European Parliament on Wednesday backed EU rules labelling investments in gas and nuclear power plants as climate friendly, throwing out an attempt to block the law that has exposed deep rifts over how to fight climate change. Gas is a fossil fuel that produces planet warming emissions, but far less than dirtier coal. Some EU states see it as a temporary alternative. Nuclear energy is free from CO2 emissions but produces radioactive waste. Nuclear backers such as France say it is vital to meet emissions cutting goals, while opponents are concerned about waste disposal. It is rejected, so Parliament... Out of 639 lawmakers present, 328 opposed a motion that sought to block the EU proposals. It's highly likely to become law, unless 20 out of 28 members decided to oppose it. The new rules will allow investors to label and market investments in gas and nuclear as green from 2023. They aim to clear up the murky world of sustainable investing by ensuring financial products making eco-friendly claims meet certain standards. The gas and nuclear rules have split EU countries, lawmakers and investors. Brussels redrafted the rules multiple times, flip-flopping over whether to grant gas plants a green tag. Industry groups have welcomed the law, but climate campaigners criticised it. Greenpeace said it would also mount a legal challenge. Sudan's coup leader Fatah al-Burhan dismissed the last civilian members of his ruling body as part of a power shift he has proposed, but protesters who have rejected his pledge again took to the streets. The blood of the martyrs did not flow in vain. That's what these Sudanese women are chanting as they took to the streets in Khartoum Wednesday to protest against coup leader Abdel Fateh al-Burhan, who they say they don't trust to make way for a civilian government. The goal is to show that we're all united in the revolution, whatever our differences. It's the youth who sacrifice their lives and keep up the fight, who keep the Sudanese flag flying high. The women's protest was joined by demonstrators across the capital, staging sit-ins and manning makeshift barricades, as they have done for the last week, despite heavy fatalities amid crackdowns by security forces. The anger comes as Army Chief Burhan, who grabbed power in a coup last October, made a shocking U-turn on Monday, saying the military would step aside for civilian forces to form a transitional government. But the country's main civilian alliance have rejected his pledge, calling it a giant ruse and encouraged the protest to continue. This speech is vague, full of double meanings. We totally refuse this proposal. We maintain that we want the end of the coup and the installation of an entirely civilian power. Since the coup, Sudan has been rocked by near-weekly protests, with thousands taking to the streets across the nation, and has grappled with the transition to democratic government since mass uprisings ousted former President Omar al-Bashir in 2019. South Korean Foreign Minister Park Jin is due in Bali soon to attend the G20 Foreign Ministers meeting. He's set to hold a slew of bilateral and multilateral talks on the sidelines of the summit, especially with the key regional partners, including his counterparts from the US and China. The G20 Foreign Ministers meeting begins in Bali, Indonesia on Thursday. Foreign Minister Park Jin, who is attending the two-day event, will hold several multilateral and bilateral talks with key partners. The U.S., Japan and China are also taking part in this week's ministerial meeting, so attention is on whether any formal meetings will be held between the countries. Already there are reports that South Korea and China are arranging bilateral talks. If the two do meet, it will be Park's first face-to-face -face meeting with his Chinese counterpart, Wang Yi. They're expected to discuss North Korean issues as well as ways to commemorate their 30th anniversary of diplomatic ties stated for next month. Meanwhile, at the NATO summit in Madrid last week, the leaders of Seoul, Washington and Tokyo met on the sidelines and agreed to strengthen their security cooperation to address North Korea's nuclear threats. This week, if the foreign ministers of the three countries sit down for talks, they will likely touch upon ways to further materialize the agreements made at the trilateral leaders' meeting last week. 
Samsung Electronics estimates its sales and operating profits for the second quarter will rise sharply on year. In terms of sales, it's estimated to be a Q2 record for the South Korean tech giant, thanks to, amongst other things, a sold performance by its semiconductors business. Despite geopolitical issues and ongoing inflation, Samsung Electronics has logged an all-time high for second quarter sales. In an earnings guidance report released on Thursday, the company says it estimates its sales from April to June to amount to a record 58.9 billion U.S. dollars, up almost 21 percent from the same period last year. The tech giant also expects an 11.3 percent on-year increase in operating profit, amounting to roughly $10.7 billion. This would mark the company's third highest second quarter profits ever. Analysts say the earnings were largely driven by operating profits from Samsung's semiconductor business. They expect the company's profits in the semiconductor business to stand at around $7.6 billion. Although demand for chips used in PCs and mobile devices declined due to the lockdown in Shanghai, there was still solid demand for chips that are usually found in data center servers. A high $1 exchange rate also appears to be contributing to earnings. For example, in the first quarter, the $1 exchange rate rose almost 2 percent compared to the previous quarter, which brought profits of some $229 million. And the exchange rate is expected to also result in $635 million in operating profits in the second quarter. Meanwhile, some industry insiders say a Samsung's third quarter is unlikely to be as fruitful. They say an economic recession might affect the company's profits in the second half of this year, with falling DRAM chip prices accelerating this. However, there are some positives to look forward to, as Samsung's new foldable phone is set to be released in the third quarter. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Millions in Shanghai queued up to a third day of the mass COVID-19 test as authorities in several Chinese cities scrambled to track and isolate infections linked to a building in which a karaoke lounge had reopened illegally. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said that regional architecture such as the Pacific Islands Forum was critical in resolving regional problems and local security issues should be resolved locally. The International Monetary Fund's managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, has said that the outlook for the global economy had darkened significantly since April and that she cannot rule out a possible recession. The World Health Organization will hold an emergency meeting on monkeypox during the week beginning July 18th at the latest. At the meeting, a committee will advise on whether to declare the outbreak a global health emergency, the WHO's highest alert level. Ravaging floods in India's Assam deprived Muslims of Eid ul Adha festivities as floodwaters swallow up their houses and properties, leaving them penniless on the streets. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. As we leave you tonight with Splain celebrating the week of festivities as the first bull run kicked off. Stay safe and have a good night.